On your Wednesday episode of Locked on Raptors, what will constitute a successful 2022-23 for the Toronto Raptors? It doesn't seem totally fair to expect them to go win a title this year, but what would be the bar that leaves you satisfied if the Raptors can clear it as a fan? We'll get into that, and how does it become a failure? Is there a failure on the table for this team? We'll talk about that and so much more in today's episode of Locked on Raptors. Thank you so much for being here. You are Locked On Raptors, your daily Toronto Raptors podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, what's going on? Welcome to episode number 1239 of Locked On Raptors for Wednesday, September the 7th. I'm your host, Sean Woodley of RaptorsHQ.com. You can find me on Twitter, as always, at Woodley Sean. You can find the show at Locked On Raptors, and you can follow, subscribe to, rate, and review the podcast wherever you get your podcast for the low, low price of On the House. You can also go to YouTube and subscribe to the show in video form each and every day for free. There's a big red subscribe button. You can't miss it if you look up Locked On Raptors on YouTube. Uh, please go do that. You're very much appreciated if you have done so and if you plan to do so in the future. I also very much appreciate you and am forever indebted to you, my best friends in the whole wide world. All right, on today's show, which is of course your first listen of the day, we are going to tackle a question that I try to tackle on every episode or every year that this podcast begins. I try to dive into it and that is to sort of set a baseline for expectations and you know try to define what a successful season would look like for the Toronto Raptors as they gear up for the 2022-23 season. This will be, I believe, 16, 17, 18, 19, 17. This is like my sixth or seventh season covering the team at this point. I think it's seven. I, I'm pretty sure it's seven. Math is hard. Uh, going back to 2016-17, that's when the show's been running. Either way, I try to answer this question every year because it's a really important question for the overall enjoyment of the season, I find. It's a really sort of fascinating thing to tackle in a league where winning a title is obviously very hard. A select few teams are kind of preordained as the teams that are most likely to win the title. You have to kind of come up with different bars for success and different achievements and milestones that you're looking for as a fan to make yourself satisfied doing this thing that we call watching the NBA and being basketball fans and watching the team for eight, nine months of our lives. So, with that, in today's show, we're going to dig into, you know, the record and what a successful record win-loss-wise would be for the Raptors and why maybe you're going to have to bring down your expectations for what the overall win total could be just because the East is so bloody stacked. We'll talk about that. We'll also dig into sort of individual personal milestones, guys sort of developing along what is successful development for this team, a team that's banking heavily on development. And then we'll round out with just sort of an overall big picture, you know, how does the team trudge forward here? What is Nick Nurse doing? How is the scheme evolving? Are we seeing growth? Are we seeing them get stuck in their ways and sort of hang on to things that maybe didn't work so well last year? We'll talk about all that. Before we get into any of that, though, we should probably hit on the latest rumor bounding around the NBA. Donovan Mitchell's traded, but that does not mean the Utah Jazz are done dealing. And there was a report yesterday from Brett Spiegel of SI Now, not one of the heavy hitters when it comes to insiders, so take it with a grain of salt, uh, saying that the Jazz are probably going to trade everybody by the time the season starts, and Jordan Clarkson is one of those guys. And I just kind of wanted to quickly talk about the concept of trying to pick the Jazz for parts here, and why I just don't think this is something the Raptors really got to be doing. Like, honestly, I'm fine if the Raptors want to just hang back and not really go and add more to this team. Yes, it's always nice to add talent, and if you can do it for a cheap amount or whatever, the, the cost of acquisition is low, then you do it. But, A, we know the Jazz are operating from a position where they're trying to get everything they can as they begin their teardown. Uh, so that's something to be dealt with. Danny Ainge is not exactly an easy negotiator. And also, it just doesn't feel like any of the guys that are available potentially from the Jazz really fit what the Raptors are trying to do. Um, you know, there's been mentions of Boyan Bogdanovich, for example. I just don't see that one happening. He makes way too much money. It would have to be like a Gary Trent Jr. situation going out. And I just don't see the Raptors wanting to make themselves worse defensively in the interest of adding a guy who's a very good shooter, to be sure, but would be coming at the expense, most likely, of your next best shooter in Gary Trent Jr. It kind of feels like shuffling deck chairs for no reason, and the money situation makes that one very difficult. Mike Conley makes way too much money. There's no need for the Raptors to go target Mike Conley right now. 
And I guess there's Rudy Gay out there if you, you know, the Raptors, of course, now have hoarded Thaddeus Young and Otto Porter and all manner of six foot eight dudes who play on the wing and maybe are a little bit old. Uh, add Rudy Gay to the mix. That'd be kind of a fun full circle thing from what happened 10 years ago when he got dealt away. Uh, but I don't think I'm really itching for that either. It, it really does feel like Jordan Clarkson is the one guy you can kind of talk yourself into from the Jazz being like legitimately decent target for the Raptors. And I still don't think it's something they should do. Because, A, the money makes it difficult. You know, you're going to have to do something along the lines of Ken Birch plus Malachi Flynn plus one more salary to even get into the ballpark to try to make it work. The Raptors are going to be dancing pretty closely with luxury tax this year. The fact that they waive Svi Mihailuk on a guaranteed contract makes that more difficult as well to negotiate if you're the Raptors. So... I, I just, I think the money's tricky. It's like 13 million bucks this year for Jordan Clarkson. And they would have to essentially send out like for like in order to maintain that luxury tax flexibility, the very little that they have. And it's just really hard to cobble together those salaries unless you're going and trading someone on a bigger deal, like a Thad Young or a Chris Boucher, which I just don't think you're doing for Jordan Clarkson, who was kind of just, you know, an extra Gary Trent Jr. with a little bit more in terms of ball handling. And that's not a bad thing by any means. Jordan Clarkson's won six man of the year. He's been a six man of the year finalist. Like he's a good player. He uh, offers something to a team, but I don't really think he offers enough to this Raptors team where you go and give up a ton to go and get him. And again, it's probably going to take a first round pick considering how the Jazz are operating right now, attached to whatever salary you can send out, doesn't feel like it's super doable, and it just feels like one of those moves to make a move, move that is on the table in September and gets people excited, even though there's not really a reason to get excited about it. I'm cool on Jordan Clarkson, not really something I think the Raptors need to be wading into. Um, you know, I can understand the argument for why he would make sense on the team, just a little extra ball handling, some backup ball handling in the event Fred Van Vliet gets hurt. Not that I would say Jordan Clarkson is a traditional point guard per se. He's kind of sized like one, but he's not really a point guard. He's more of a gunner too. And, you know, it's a nice thing to have for sure. A little extra scoring pop never hurt anybody, especially this Raptors team, which is kind of dying for extra scoring pop. But it just doesn't feel like it's worth the squeeze, especially when you consider that he's a pending free agent, potentially. He, like Gary Trent Jr., has a player option at the end of this year. He's got about 14 and a half million bucks that he's due next year if he opts in. And, you know, that's kind of, that could go either way. Maybe he opts in and needs that 14 million bucks to kind of keep making steady money in the NBA as things kind of get stratified and guys in the middle class like Clarkson maybe are looking at lower grade salaries as we go forward here as the higher end guys keep getting paid. He's not a max guy, and we're finding a sort of, you know, max guys and mid-level guys sort of stratification here, and Jordan Clarkson could very well be looking at the mid-level if he opts out this season. So maybe the argument is you bring in Jordan Clarkson, hope he doesn't opt out, and maybe he becomes your Gary Trent Jr. replacement in a way, although I think he's a very different player than Gary Trent Jr., not the same defender, even though I don't think Gary Trent Jr. is any great shakes defensively, he's certainly better than Jordan Clarkson. Um, you know, and so I guess that's the argument for, is you get a little bit of insurance if Gary Trent Jr. opts out and is too expensive to want to keep around, maybe you can keep Jordan Clarkson. Maybe he's wary of going into a free agent market and seeing what's happened to a lot of guys where they've kind of gotten squeezed out, forced to the mid-level range, and are making less money. So we'll see. I, I, I just I don't think Jordan Clarkson is a thing for the Raptors this year, and I don't think you can go and get into an arms race with the top end of the Eastern Conference as teams like the Cavs make moves and the Nets come back into play. It's too early, it feels to me, to go and make reactionary moves in response to to what those teams are doing. So just sit tight. You know, I, I think there's a reason to be bullish on this Raptors team. Even if it's going to be a more difficult road this year in the Eastern Conference, they're not at a spot right now where they need to go and change up the whole playbook and get off the plan and, you know, mortgage future assets to go and get a Jordan Clarkson type to maybe make them more of a five seed than a six or seven seed. Um, with that, Let's sort of play that forward and talk about the expectations for the season, the win total. Can the Raptors get to a certain threshold? Do they need to get to a certain threshold to keep you, the fan, satisfied? We'll get to that in just one sec. But first, I want to tell you about our friends over at Built Bar. Of course, we've talked about Built Bar in this podcast for years now, and it's because they're the bloody best. And they've got themselves Built Bar Puffs now, which you can go and check out. It's one of life's greatest joys, and they have a new flavor. It's indulgent cookie dough covered in chocolate. Built has done it again. Cookie dough chunk puffs have a light and chewy texture, real cookie dough chunks, and of course they're covered in 100% real chocolate. All the joys of eating cookie dough without the hassle of making it, plus it's healthy for you. All the peaky behind the curtain. I love cookie dough. It's one of my favorite things in the world. I'm a monster. 
I used to, when I was a baker at a Tim Hortons, go into the uh, freezers and just eat raw frozen cookie dough out of the boxes. Uh, yeah, that's what I used to do. It was disgusting, but that's how much I love cookie dough. You throw it into a built puff, you really can't miss. I think the puffs are great. I'm not a marshmallow guy myself at all. I really don't vibe with marshmallows more often than not, but I really like them when it comes to the built puffs. They're tasty, they're light. And they're not giving you all of the garbage that you typically think you're getting when you're eating a combination of marshmallow and cookie dough. It's just not. 160 calories is all they have. 15 grams of protein as well. It's collagen protein, which your body absorbs more efficiently and provides tons of health benefits. You can eat something that tastes good and feel and is good for you. Go to built.com, use the promo code LOCKED15 to get 15% off your order. That's the promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at built.com. Go get yourself some puffs. All right, we continue on here with your first listen of the day, digging into the question of expectations for the Toronto Raptors. Just to finish off on my point before, I had another thing that I wanted to get out of my brain, and I forgot on the Jordan Clarkson thing. Don't feel the need at all to go and trade for Jordan Clarkson or any of the Jazz misfits who are about to be cast off to various spots around the league. Uh, you know, the alternative for me is if you are looking for some ball handling, some backup, you know, juice just with the ball in the guy's hands who can run an offense, run a possession, fill in in the event of a Fred injury, I would much rather go and try to, like, lure Kemba Walker and maybe get a buyout from the Pistons there, uh, maybe make him amenable to a buyout. There was a report today, I believe in The Athletic, uh, about the Pistons, and they're just not buying out Walker right now. Walker's not really playing ball in a buyout because he doesn't have a team lined up. If you want to go and get Kemba Walker on the minimum, that to me is the move. If you're looking for extra ball handling, you don't have to go trade stuff for Jordan Clarkson when he might be gone in a year anyway. You can get Kemba Walker for a year at $2 million bucks and be happy with that as your 10th or 11th man and not really have a whole lot invested in him. Anyway, but besides the point, let's get to expectations, shall we? Uh, the Raptors won 48 games last season. They were very fun, very good, very weird, very inconsistent. They were up and down defensively. Their offense was maybe a little bit better overall than expected, but their half-court offense was not very good. It was near the bottom of the league, as we've kind of talked about a whole bunch over the course of the offseason. Their transition offense wasn't even that effective. It was near the bottom of the league in efficiency. They just ran it up in terms of volume and were scoring enough in transition to make it all kind of work and sing. And so I could kind of see both arguments for, all right, the Raptors are going to win more games than they won last year because they weren't ever really whole. They had a ton of injuries, lots of different things befell them. I could also see the other side where you say, hey, maybe you expect a bit of a, a fallback here to, you know, 44, 45 wins, something like that. Maybe their sort of defensive scheme gets figured out a little bit more and they don't have the heights that they had in the second half of last year when they really started to come on strong. Maybe they become a little bit more of an easy team to decipher night to night because people People know what they're running out there. We'll get to the con the concept of them sort of evolving with their defensive stylings in the next segment. But I, I think it's, you know, totally fair to expect they're going to win more games than they won last year. As much as you could sort of argue the downsides and the reasons to fall back, I'm more on the side of there's a lot to like with this team. They are doing something kind of novel and new. That's usually good for a few regular season wins just because you're catching teams off guard on random Wednesday nights in the regular season. And we also know that Nick Nurse is going to push his team and press all the buttons to the, the effect of trying to win as many games as possible. He's very good at milking wins out of teams. The 2019-20 team was a near 60-win pace, better than 60-win pace by the time they went 7-1 and won in the bubble by the end of the year. Like, that was a ridiculously good team. That was a wins machine. You think back to even before Nick Nurse during the culture reset season, that was another wins machine of a team. 59 wins that year. Like, this team just wins games. Obviously, new cast, different players, different people, but Nick Nurse has been a through line through most of it, and he's very good at finding a way to maximize what his roster is going to give him. Even in the Tampa season, before COVID hit the team, I sort of reiterate this all the time, they were on their road to being like the fourth seed in the Eastern Conference in that Tampa season, despite all that was going on. It, it, you know, Nick Nurse is good at his job, as it turns out. There's reasons to quibble with him and have your issues, but very good at getting wins out of the basketball teams that he coaches, which is pretty fantastic. So, with that, you know, I, I think you probably hope at least 48 wins is kind of the, the threshold that the Raptors can hit this season. I think they have 50 wins in them just because of all the different things we're talking about and the fact that I'm imagining there's going to be quite a bit of internal development as well from guys like Scotty Barnes and Precious Achua and maybe even Pascal Siakam and Fred Van Vliet, Noji Ananobi, the sort of old heads who we know, maybe there's some growth in there as well. 
And I, I just, I feel like <laughs> I, I have not been super bullish on the last couple Raptors teams. I've been a little bit more sort of reserved and expecting kind of a ho-hum, middle-of-the-road type season. I think this team is the one to get excited about among recent teams. I, I just think the Eastern Conference is so good that it could kind of dig into the win total. That said, you know, there have been conferences in the past, you think of the Western Conference, where like 48 win Phoenix, Phoenix Suns teams are missing the playoffs and finishing ninth. Like you can have six or seven 50 win teams in a conference if the rest of the conference is terrible. And I kind of think that might be the case here. I think we're going to see five or six really bad Eastern Conference teams that'll sort of line the coffers of all the elite teams in the Eastern Conference. And I still think 50 wins are there to be had for the Raptors. It's just probably going to require that it's a bit more of a, again, clumped together Eastern Conference like it was last year, where you have all these teams kind of fighting it out. You start getting teams piling up the 60 win totals. That's going to just because of the fact of math, there's only so many wins to go around in a season. That's going to cut into what the Raptors are able to do. But if like the top six or seven teams in the East are all kind of around 50 wins, there's no reason the Raptors can't be one of those six or seven teams. I think they will be one of those six or seven teams. Um, But I also am not looking at this season as, all right, well, the win total is the thing that's going to define the success for me. Maybe that is what you're looking at. There's also the playoffs you have to look at as well. What is the nature of them getting to whatever their record is? What do their peripheral numbers say? You know, are there bits of growth when it comes to, you know, how they're getting their points, how they're stopping the other team, how they're evolving in their defensive schemes, things like that. That's all kind of part and parcel to this discussion as well. And how you sort of define success depends on all the context that goes into it, right? Like you can have a 45 win team that sees obvious internal growth from guys who, you know, is pretty good against good teams and, you know, it punches well against the the elite tier or whatever. And you can still be happy with that and say, hey, that's a successful year. Um, I, I guess there's a little bit more black and white when it comes to the playoffs and advancement there. They lose in the first round in six games last season. You know, you can flip a coin in, in a couple of those instances in that series. Maybe the Raptors go on to win it. Game three being the kind of one that stands out with Joel Embiid hitting the big three to put him up 3-0 and make it pretty insurmountable for the Raptors, even though it seemed like for a second they might go ahead and do the thing. Um, you know, it's tough to come back from down 3-0. A couple things go differently. The Raptors maybe have a chance in that series, considering James Harden did not have himself an amazing series. The Raptors have a pretty good scheme for Joel Embiid most of the time. They started to slow down Tyrese Maxey as they altered their coverage as the series went along. Lots of good stuff happened in that series. And I think for sure you view last season as success for the Raptors. I guess it then comes into, you know, what do you want to see from them in terms of advancement in the playoffs this year? For me... I think there is a little bit more sort of gray area to it than just, well, they make it to the second round or they don't. I feel like there's lots of folks who would say this should be be a second round team. Based on what happened last year, you take positive steps forward. That's a certainly one way to look at it. I kind of view it as a little bit more of a what's the context of what their first round losses do they lose in seven games to the bucks do they lose in four games to the nets like that to me is sort of how you determine the successful or lack the success or lack thereof of the season more than anything else so it's hard to determine but for me like if the raptors can have a competent sort of close again you know grudge match with some sort of team in the, in the first round maybe they lose to one of the heavy heaters of the east that's no shame in that the eastern conference is loaded this season the top four or five teams are really really good there shouldn't be any shame in losing that series as long as they don't get completely wiped away like 2014 15 against the wizards i think you could probably be pretty happy with a first round and a noble exit um but you know you don't want to have too much stagnation right and uh, two straight first round losses will certainly rub some people the wrong way and i will say as much as i'm not putting that kind of heft on this season i don't think that they need to make the second round for this to be a successful year i think the individual storylines of players growing are going to be way more important as we'll get to in a second but if you know the raptors go and lose in the first round again this season then the honeymoon is over like that's it next season it will be all right get past the first round or we're going to start thinking about some things i would assume it does feel like this team is in a little bit of a joyous state right now where they have some runway guys are under contract although not for super long and you know this season if it goes well that you know is another positive step forward and everyone feels good but if it's the same result as last year maybe different contexts, different circumstances, whatever, then I do think there will be sort of corners of the fan base who are like, all right, well, shit or get off the pot now. Go win a series, please. And the honeymoon phase will be over. The expectations for the following season are going to be a hell of a lot higher in a way that I don't know if they are coming into this year just because last year did feel like found money in a lot of ways. So 
as far as like the win total, if they can get to 48, 49, 50, I think that's great. If they are anywhere under like 45, then I'm sure something's kind of gone wrong here. And that probably means they're very much in the play-in mix as opposed to the top six mix, which is what you want to be in, of course. It's going to be tough to make it there with the Cavs jumping up and all of the good teams that are in the East already. But I think, you know, the, the win total for me is not really going to be the defining thing. The playoff advancement is not going to be the defining thing of success for me. The defining thing for success this season, to me, will be what do we see from the internal development, which the Raptors have put a whole lot of weight into and a whole lot of expectation and hope on. We'll talk about that in just one second here. But first, just want to remind you that Locked on NBA is available for you each and every day on your favorite podcast apps. Go check it out. Uh, subscribe, follow, rate, review, tell a friend. It's uh, YouTube, all the different Apple podcasts, Spotify, Google, Odyssey, et cetera, et cetera. Subscribe to Locked on NBA every day, and they are breaking down all of the stuff going on across the league. All right, we will continue on here, round up the show with some final thoughts on the expectations and the sort of thresholds for success for the 2022-23 Toronto Raptors. And like I said just before the break, I think the Raptors season is very much going to be defined by what we see from the internal development side of things. Not so much the win total, not so much the end result, but more so... Do you see positive steps forward for the guys who are important and who need to make positive steps forward if the Raptors are going to fancy themselves one of the contenders of the Eastern Conference in, you know, 23, 24, 25, beyond? So there's a few guys, obviously, who come to mind here. Scotty Barnes is number one. Like, I don't really know how to properly evaluate Scotty Barnes. He was so bloody good as a rookie, so beyond expectation, that setting my, like, baseline level of expectation for Scotty this year feels a little bit difficult. I find myself, A, sometimes feeling like I'm low on what Scotty can do, and then sometimes feeling like I'm too high on what Scotty can do, and it's all because I have no idea how to sort of take the pre-draft expectations for him, the pre-season expectations for him last year, the way he blew them out of the water last year, the things that still need some work for sure, like the sort of game-to-game, scheme-to-scheme defensive consistency. The three-point shot obviously had some moments last year, but for the most part was pretty ho-hum and below average. You know, it's hard to kind of put all this stuff in to come up with like, all right, this would be the season I'd like to see from Scotty Barnes, but I do think like the things that will define a successful year for Barnes are like, does he get better at the stuff he was not so great at last year? Does he improve as a defender? Does he become a guy who kind of matches the reputation that he's already sort of carrying? Like he seems to have this reputation as an ace defender. I don't think we saw that from him last year necessarily, but eventually, you know, if you start gaining that reputation, it's going to become reality at some point. Like there's, there's a reason why, These guys are calling out Scotty Barnes and saying he's an excellent defender. There's something going on there. If he can tie it together a little bit more, be a little bit less over-aggressive at the point of attack where he's getting blown by all the time, a bit more of a team defender, sort of helping and filling in the gaps that Pascal Siakam so often has to fill by himself as he's recovering and cleaning up the mistakes of others. Like, that will go a long way, I think, to sort of defining this as a successful year for Scotty Barnes. Same goes for, I think, just like his usage within the team. And I think for the Raptors to truly feel like they've had a successful year that was worthwhile, that did all the stuff you were hoping to see, they need to feature Scotty Barnes pretty prominently. To me, like I said, the vision for this team is Siakam and Barnes are the dueling heads of the snake. Everyone else is in their orbit, but they are your primary initiators and you're seeing what you can do with it maybe you learn that Scotty Barnes is not going to be a number one on the ball creator this season. Seems premature to learn that, but maybe you find that out. And that's useful. That's important. Maybe you won't define it as success for him, but finding and knowing exactly what you have and and sort of going forward with that, that's super important as well for a team at the stage that the Raptors are in right now. You know, Scotty's got plenty of time. I don't think this year is a defining season for him or anything like that, but you certainly want to see some growth forward. And I think a leveling up of his role within the team is kind of number one for me. So it's not even totally on Scotty. It's kind of on the front, the, the front office and the coaching staff to sort of put him in the position to take those steps as well well, which I think they will, because why wouldn't they? They're totally invested in Scotty Barnes, as they should be. He's fantastic, and he was Rookie of the Year for a reason. When it comes to other guys, I think there's sort of three guys who stand out as the sort of key developmental figures. One would be uh, OG Ananobi, again, another year where he is coming in with, you know, I think a lot of expectation. I kind of think we know what OG is at this point. Like, he's just like an excellent, wonderful basketball player that every team needs. 
Is he going to be more than that in terms of on-ball creation and stuff? I don't really know. He feels like he's maybe got a little bit more of a robotic game and not sort of the flow and ease with which some of these on-ball creating wings are able to create offense and sort of get into the flow. I just don't know if OG quite has that. He's a little bit too rigid for that. That's fine. I have no problem if OG is the exact same player he was last season. Obviously, the political side of it all and, you know, is he happy? Is he happy with his role? Is he getting enough looks? Blah, 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 blah. That'll, I'm sure, be like a small undercurrent for this season as well based on the offseason reporting that came out. But I kind of think we know what OG is. But if there is something more in there, if there is an extra gear of ball handling there, that goes a long way to sort of changing the fortunes of this team, I think. Um, and so we'll see. But again, I don't think there's really like failure on the table for OG unless he completely falls up, you know, off a cliff when it comes to a three-point shot or something like that. He feels like he's pretty steady, but there is like an upside there that everyone seems to perceive is still there with him that could certainly take this season from being, you know, another proof of concept for him, uh, you know, that he's like a really excellent 3 and D wing who's not your number one option or number two option. If there is a click there, then things get really interesting really quickly. Next guy's Precious Achua. He might be the most important, honestly. I might have ordered these wrong. Precious as the sort of guy who makes the vision six foot nine work. I still fully believe that's the case. You can't make this work unless you have a guy who can do center type things, you know, setting screens, dive into the basket, picking and popping. Obviously, defensively, can you play multiple coverages? Can you play a drop? Can you come up high? Can you do everything in between? Can you cover the ground in the middle of the floor that a Pascal Siakam has been asked to do so often the last couple of years? Can you get a guy like Precious Achua to be that sort of backstop, the guy who can be the cleaner upper, the, the dude with the paper towels to make all the messes go away? Like, that is really important. I think he's got it in him. Like, he's a very, very special defensive player in terms of the tools he has, in terms of some of the stuff he's shown, the switchability, all of that. Are there steps to be taken there? And you have to sort of marry that with the offensive growth we saw in the back part of last year. If we see the early season pressures of Chua again, where he was bad at making decisions, bad at finishing around the basket, bad at finishing putbacks, bad at putting the ball on the deck, like all of that stuff, then, you know, you're probably looking at it being a bit more of a failure for, for Precious. But if you can continue over what you saw at the end of last year and into the postseason, that to me feels like the successful barrier for Precious to clear is be the player you were in the second half last year and just do that over a longer time for a bit more proof of concept. To me, that is incredibly important. One, for the Raptors' vision, the roster they have actually working, and B, for him as like a long-term core piece with this team, which I feel like he is, and I feel like he's kind of unquestionably one of those guys right now, but, uh, you know, things can go wrong. Guys have all sorts of hype, and then they fall on their faces, and things happen, but I think he's really massive for it. And then also, another important guy here, I think, is Gary Trent Jr., and obviously things are complicated by the fact that his contract is coming up at the end of the year, potentially, if he opts out, which he probably will at this point, um, and that, I mean, maybe he won't. Maybe he'll realize that 18 million bucks or whatever he's making next season is what he's going to sort of be able to slot into and he can make more money as the cap goes up the following season, potentially. Maybe he does opt in and kick it down the road a little bit. That's for way down the road for, for us to figure out. But as far as Gary Trent Jr., like I do think there's a lot riding on this season for him to prove that he should be part of this team long-term. The defense, I think, needs to sort of continue to be a little bit more disciplined. And while he's a great high event defender, he also is the reason for a lot of the breakdowns because he's sort of the initial guy who gambles and then gets burned. That's tough, especially for a team that values rotation and being in position so much. If a guy is instantly getting out of position, it's just kind of a thing you're playing catch up on for the rest of the 24 seconds on the clock. And, you know, I, I wonder if maybe they kind of rein things in a little bit more here in terms of their overall offense and their, the way they generate offense, right? Like where they get turnovers, they get offensive rebounds. That's their main bread and butter. I wonder if they kind of dial it back a little bit this season and trust themselves to be good in the half court. Gary Trev Jr. will be very important to that as well. He's an excellent three-point shooter. Can he add a little bit more in terms of playmaking to his game? Again, he's 23 years old or something like that. There's certainly room for him to grow. I haven't seen tons of great signs that it's coming. But if Gary Trent Jr. adds a couple of little wrinkles to his game, I do think that kind of changes the outlook for him with the team going forward and, you know, their, their level of investment in him. If he stagnates a little bit, if he, you know, doesn't succeed, if he's brought off the bench or if he it gets perturbed because he's not closing some games because Precious Achua is sliding in there, then I think it gets a little bit icky. And, you know, you could be looking at this being kind of a disaster season from the Raptors and Gary Trent's perspective because... All, everything gets muddled. What's the future? Does he get dealt at the deadline for a team that has designs on winning a lot of games again? Like, 
that could be a really, really sore spot for this team this season if you don't see that growth from Gary Trent Jr. that makes him a no-brainer part of this team going forward. And I do think he has to do some things to make that the case. Like, again, the defense and the playmaking and just the general shot selection. I know sometimes they need him to be the bailout guy. He's kind of like the old Serge Ibaka where sometimes you just got to have a dude who's willing to let it fly. But sometimes he can shoot them out of games. And that, I think, is going to be a really, really interesting thing to watch this season. So... You get some internal growth from guys like OG and Precious and Trent and obviously Scotty. You know, there's Siakam and, and Fred are kind of part and parcel to this as well. Like, that to me is way more telling of whether it will determine this a successful season. If they win 44 games, but you see that growth from those guys and you've got a little bit more clarity on what the future is going to look like, to me, that's success for this season. And then the last thing to kind of consider is just the overall, you know, I kind of just mentioned there with Trent, like the overall approach that this front office and coaching staff takes to this team and this vision that they've kind of concocted here. Like, do they dial things back a little bit? Do they trust they can create a bit more of a half court offense do they have the plan in place to try to create a bit more of an elaborate efficient half court offense which was just not good at all last season can they you know leverage scotty barnes into a little bit more creation can they use fred van vliet's excellent tools as an off-ball guy to milk a little bit more out of the half court because they're funneling things through siakam and barnes like that stuff to me is really telling and if you know the raptors come out and they do the same thing they did last year where they crashed the offensive glass at the second highest rate in the league behind Memphis and they force turnovers like nobody's business and their half-court offense still kind of is in mud and they need to do those things which kind of compromise them in other ways in order to get that offensive rating to like a respectable level then that, that to me feels like maybe the biggest sort of failure this team could have is if they don't innovate a little bit in terms of how they get their points and in terms of how they defend look that i think they should be playing aggressive defense from time to time for sure they are very long they have the tools to perform what nick nurse is asking them to do for the most part but Sometimes, maybe, you just got to chill a little bit. It's a 82-game season. There's a lot of games to be played, and going 110% every single night maybe is not the best way to, you know, pace yourself throughout a year. And the defensive aggression that this team has, like, at some point, I do wonder if it does play into the lack of success offensively. They're expending so much energy on one end. It makes it difficult to get things rolling on the other. Like, that is going to be such a fascinating storyline this season that I'm really keeping an eye on. And I think there will be some evolution. I think there will be some ways in which they try to liven up the half-court offense a little bit. We know Nick Nurse is going to coach defense first, and that's just the way it is. I wonder if the success in the back part of last season might free Nick Nurse up to spend, I don't know, a day or two on offense in training camp this year as opposed to his usual zero time on offense in training camp. Like, do they find different sort of sets? Do they work more pick and roll in somehow? Um, maybe that opens up space for Malachi Flynn to get in there with a, with a back end roll. That's really, I think, going to be like the biggest overarching thing. Not the wins, not the even the individual players taking steps, but does the team evolve and sort of adapt to the people that it has on the team a little bit more and show some growth there and show some versatility? Because right now, it's kind of a one-trick pony. It's a very fun and cool and exciting one-trick pony to watch, but if you have designs on winning major games down the line, you know, two or three years from now, probably time to start mixing things up and work on maybe being a little bit less gimmicky in the way you go about getting your points. You know, it can certainly work. And we've seen the Grizzlies have success with the offensive rebounding sort of sellout as well. But I do wonder if maybe there's a way to bring a little bit more balance to the team now that perhaps you can look at the half-court offense and say they have the tools here to put together something at least halfway decent and not bottom five in the league. Uh, that's kind of it I have on, on thoughts in terms of, you know, what success will look like. I suppose you could also look at the back end bench guys and say, hey, if Delano Banton or Justin Champagne can pop, that will certainly go into the idea of this being a successful season. If Malachi Flynn can make his way in the NBA and actually, you know, sort of perform all of that's on the table too, as like things that could swing whether you view this as a successful or unsuccessful season. But always like to take the time to sort of set those expectations and feel free to jump in the comments and let us know who or, or what is going to define success for you. Some people are title or bust. That's not the way I go about it because I think that's a pretty joyless way to live in a sport where, you know, a third of the NBA has never even won an NBA title. It doesn't seem like a way to actually enjoy yourself necessarily, but you know, different strokes, whatever. 
Um, but yeah, let me know in, in the comments what, what you think as far as what would be a successful season for the Raptors this year. Uh, and with that, we'll round it out there. Thank you so much for tuning in. We'll be back again tomorrow with Katie Heindel. Topic TBD, but I'm sure it will be fun because we love Katie. So that'll be tomorrow. And then Friday, uh, working on some guests and stuff like that as well. So it's the off season. Planning things out is a little bit less of a priority. We're just going to kind of talk about what we're feeling like talking about. And we'll be back to daily the week that Media Day kicks off. So September the 26th, I believe, we'll be returning to our daily schedule. So you have that to look forward to as well. With that, we'll leave it there. Thank you for tuning in. And before you go and uh, listen to something else after the show, make sure that thing is the Locked On uh, Ultimate Football Preview as they are doing a wonderful job over there. Uh, for your second listen, go check out. It's an eight-episode extravaganza to get you ready for the NFL season. The local team of experts on the Locked On Podcast Network, plus a betting angle from Lee Sterling of Locked On Bets, all combining into the Ultimate NFL Preview. Search for the Ultimate Pro Football Preview 2022 on your Odyssey app, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. It's one of the best things we do all year. I had a hard time finding the copy to promote it, uh, but it's not for lack of it being great. It's fantastic. Go check it out if you're a football fan with the season drawing near i think this weekend is week one um so that's awesome fun t- fun times go check it out the ultimate pro football preview for your second listen and we will talk to you again on thursday with another episode of locked on raptors bye-bye 